Yeah. That's great. Sorry? You're all good to go now. Okay, so as I said, I'm a, a scientist at the University of Tasmania. I'm a geophysicist by training. I'm going to talk to you a bit about virtual geology, but I also want to talk about some software that we produced, which is freeware software for geometric analysis of 3D photorealistic models. So what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk a bit about our OSGEO library. I'll talk a bit about how we make the photorealistic models, which for some of you will be stuff you know about, but for others might be new. Then I'll talk about what type of geometric analyses we can actually undertake. I'll show you the capabilities of the software, how we validated its applicability, and then show you a few examples. So we have a library called OSGEO. It's the Virtual Library of Australia's Geology. We started producing it about seven or eight years ago in a small way, and we collect three-dimensional models of the geology of Australia. We collect 360-degree uh, images, we have video and 3D, 360 video. We also have megapixel, oh, sorry, gigapixel style imagery of a variety of different areas. And we integrate all of this into a, into a range of different virtual tours, which can be um, delivered both on screen and in some cases through headsets. So I've just got a little video now that I'll play that shows you some of the characteristics of the OSGEOL website. Let's hopefully it will play. So this is the OSGEOL website. It's www.osgeol.org. We've got about 4,000 localities in Australia that we've documented the geology. We've got, here you can see a text-based uh, text query. We've gone and said, show me some folds in the Malacuta. There's some metadata associated with them. We load our data through Sketchpad. So here now is a... You can go back to the microphone, so otherwise you won't be able to hear in your recording. Oh, I'm pretty loud. Um, <laughs> so what we can see here, we also have a spatial interface which is constructed using Leaflet. We have an underlying Django database and we draw um, imagery in from a variety of different places. Here we're looking at a reverse fault in the New England fold belt. So this is happening at about two times real speed to give you an idea of how rapidly this responds. I'm going to take you to an archetypical bit of geology. This is Marble Bar in the Pilbara in Western Australia. And so we'll look initially at a drone-based model, a 3D model of the entire outcrop, then we'll come in a variety of stages to look at different products. So here's an overall drone-based model of the Marble Bar outcrop, which is an outcrop of 3,500 million-year-old rocks in Western Australia. We can come in and look at them in high resolution, as you can see. We can look at something like this, zoom right in on it. These are very high resolution, fully geometrically correct and geolocated imagery. Here's another example of the pillow basalts from Marble Bar. As I indicated, in addition to that, we also have, in this case, this is a 350 megapixel image of a particular part of the outcrop at about 0.1 of a millimetre resolution. But we also have, in some cases, gigapixel style images. And then, of course, we have standard range of 360 degree views that we can utilise to roam around the outcrop and build virtual tours. So this is the OSGEOL database. We've built this over the course of six or seven years. And as I said, we currently house about 4,000 localities around Australia in this database. How do we produce the three-dimensional models? And that's what I'm going to talk about later. For some of you, you may have a good appreciation of this. You've utilised structure from motion processes to generate three-dimensional models. It's a really simple process. Take any old camera, as long as you're a reasonable photographer, take photographs from multiple orientations, ask the computer, with a lot of linear algebra involved to solve the problem and construct a three-dimensional model. So I'll just show you a little, for those who aren't familiar, I'll show a little video on how this works. Oops, I've gone one too far. Let's go there. This video hopefully will start. Well, yes. So here we have the process of blue things in the photographs. These are located points that have been located by something called the SIFT algorithm. Then the next stage in the process that we utilise builds a dense, a dense point cloud. So here's a dense point cloud. If we zoom in, there's a few million points here delineating in exactly the same way as we would have a LiDAR data set delineating the geometry, but also the colour range of the image of the, the region. We then take those data and we turn them into a triangulated model, which is this stage now. And so now we've built a, a, a three-dimensional surface and just to show you how readily we can capture the geometry of this object, if we now image this as a shaded relief model, you can see how effectively we've captured the geometry of this particular model, which we can place in a fully three-dimensional um, UTM coordinate frame. The final stage then is to texture map this. 
And for us in earth science, this texture mapping is critically important because a lot of the information that we get from these models comes not from the geometry so much, but from the texture map. So having created models like this, what we really wanted to be able to do then was to say to our students and to others, we want you to be able to replicate what, what you can do in the field, what you can do at this actual locality. We want to replicate that in software. And so that's what we set out to do with the software that I'm going to illustrate. So what would, do we want to do in earth sciences? We want to often do geometric analysis. Without going into the details of geology, you can see these rocks are pretty screwed up. And you can see that someone has superimposed upon them the, the folded nature of these rocks. We want to be able to analyse that. So a geologist in the field would take a compass and go and measure things. They might measure planar features in space. They might also measure linear features in space, the orientations. And then we would analyse that information using analyze and display it using something called a stereographic projection, which is a means of representing both linear and planar features in a, uh, in a three-dimensional linear and planar features in a two-dimensional map, effectively. So that's one type of geometric analysis we might like to undertake. Another type of analysis that geologists commonly do in a field exposure might be to measure things and produce, if you like, a picture of what the exposure looks like. So here are some... Here are some layers, and maybe we would do measurements that would produce a picture, something like this, that shows variations in grain size as a function of height up the outcrop. We wanted in our software to be able to replicate all of these, all of these activities in such a way that it would be intuitive for our students. So we built a piece of software which we call GeoBiz 3D. We developed it in Unity, so it deploys to PC and Mac. The inputs that are currently a bit restricted, we input KMZ files which come from something called Agisoft, which is a common photogrammetric software. We also have an importer for OBJ files, although we've only tested that with a few different varieties of OBJ files. So if you tried it on your flavour, it may not necessarily work. So what does the software do? It measures geometries, distances, the orientations and characteristics of planes and lines. We can make stratigraphic logs with true thickness. We can also take a three-dimensional outcrop and annotate it in a variety of different ways. And we can export the data that we measure as CSV files and the three-dimensional geometric objects that we put into these real-world UTM-coordinated spaces. We can export those as 3D DXF. So now, this little video, which hopefully will run, will show you some of the capabilities of GeoBiz 3D running in slightly faster than real time. So now we're going to measure the orientations of different locations and they're being plotted on the steering net on the right hand side. So these are the three dimensional orientations being reported and also in the table down below. So these are just the orientations of surface features of the model, but we might also want to measure the orientations of features that cut through the model. And we can do that, as you can see here, incredibly rapidly and easily. So we might want to measure something else. This is something called a joint plane, which is important for geotechnical work, for instance. In addition, we could measure a linear feature. So here we'll go in and measure a line in space. And now we've measured that line in space. It's already plotted on the serial net. All of this is interactive, and we, can, and we are effectively replicating something that our students can do in the field. We can now go onto the model, and in three dimensions, we can annotate the model in 3D. So it's fully three-dimensional, um, fully three-dimensional annotation tied to the surface of the model. We can add other things like um, you know, annotation to the model. We can also make measurements. Here's another example. In this example, this is a 50-metre high sea cliff near Newcastle, New South Wales, somewhere we couldn't measure physically. You couldn't go there and measure it. But we built some software to enable us to measure the true thicknesses of these layers. And now to measure a we're in basically real time here measuring the thickness of each of these layers and we can describe what they are, what their grain size characteristics are for individual locations. This is going you know, very slightly quicker than I could do it in real life, but you can see in a very short amount of time we can get an amazing amount of information about this cliff. So here's a final interpretation of that cliff near Redhead in New South Wales. The annotations, the measurements of geometric features together with the measured um, indication of what the rocks are up on this cliff. 50 metre high cliff, we could never go there. So in addition to being able to let our students replicate what they would do in the field, we can do things which we can't do in the field. We can't go and scramble up this 50 metre high cliff. It's impossible to do that. But we can now do this with this sort of software. 
Okay, so we validated this. We said, well, you know, sure, it's good. We can make measurements, but are they any good? We went to a quarry just up the way. This is a quarry in Waterworks. And we went out and we acquired, it, acquired a rendition of this. We measured all the features in the virtual space. Then we went out with a compass and we measured as many of them as we could in, with the compass. And then we plotted them over the top of one another in this thing called a stereographic projection. And we're pretty happy that we get based upon our procedures for acquiring a geological outcrop and their metric, we're getting what we could in the field, we're getting it geometrically. And when I did the sums on this, the time it took me to acquire the topography of that, process it and measure it, was about the same amount of time as it took me to do a comparable number of physical measurements on the, on the rock itself. Yet we then have the visual representation of the outcrop. And we could also access things that we couldn't access. So just to finish, I'd like to show you how we can apply this, not merely to the scale of features that you've seen already in the diagrams, but also to the other scale features. So we've done visualisations now of thousands of our hand specimens, which we used to teach in. Very important, obviously, in COVID, because we had to go to teaching in the virtual sense. So this student on the right-hand side is now utilising the software to interpret this three-dimensional hand specimen. As you can see, here we're dealing with something that's perhaps seven or eight centimetres across, fully geometrically related, and they can do measurements on this hand specimen and also annotate the hand specimen. Stepping up a scale, here is a data set acquired with a drone. So this is the outside of Mariah Island, a place you can never really get to, um, but has some pretty fantastic geology. I'm showing some annotation across the top. We've put some measurements now up on the, up on the uh, model. And then we might add some annotations of the model that I've just put on. The process of doing this interpretation is only a few minutes. And we can get this sort of level of geometric interpretation from these models. Now, I'm showing you this principally from the perspective of geology. But I hope that you can understand that a piece of software like this potentially has other applications in other fields where geometric measurements of three-dimensional models might be an important aspect. And as a final aspect, let's step up even further in scale. This is the Chos Malal fold belt in Argentina. So we're looking at a chunk of data. This is data stolen from Google. Um, and so a satellite model, about 20 kilometres across. We can go to this location and we can make measurements of the orientation of layers from this satellite image. Without actually going there, we can take our students now to another part of the world and we can do detailed geology, relatively detailed geology. We'll add on some of the annotations here. So now we've annotated the locations of things called anticline, some synclines and some large faults. And so now we've done an interpretation. I whacked this one out in about five minutes last night. So it's really easy software to use. And we deliberately made it easy to use because we wanted our students not to have a large learning path. We wanted to be able to get them in the classroom, have them doing real work in a matter of minutes. So this software is freely available. Um, we don't give away the source, but we'll give you executables that run on PC and a Mac. Um, and, you know, if you think that you want something that it doesn't currently do, if we can scrounge the funds, we can, we can add additional functionality to the software. Come on, keep going on. It doesn't want to go on. Right. Okay, so just to summarise then, this is freeware software. It's for the interpretation of these 3D photorealistic models, which are increasingly becoming important in the spatial community. We think we've produced a very simple, intuitive user interface, and we have primarily designed this for geoscience applications whereby we want to measure planar and linear features in space, their orientations, their lengths, their areas, all of these sorts of things. For us, it's important to link this to something called a stereographic projection. For you, perhaps not so important. We also have facilities which we'd like to expand for addition of things like polylines in 3D space and text annotation. And as you see, as I illustrated before, we can apply this to things at the scale of a few centimetres up to hundreds of kilometres and works equally well, provided that we have the data in the right formats. So I hope I've given you some impression of what our software can do. You're welcome to get a copy from it, of it from me and have a play with it if you have applications that, that might benefit from this sort of approach. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Well, the reason, if you, if you see... I'm just asking that to a headset, but it takes a mobile phone model. 
Okay, if you see the, um, the chunky nature of the buttons on here, we originally built this thinking that we would, we would have it running, because we were building in Unity, we could deploy it onto a, a tablet or we could deploy it other things. So we made the buttons big and chunky, so in this position. When we tried deploying it onto the Android and, and Mac tablets that we had at the time, we found they weren't quite up to the task on models that had a lot of vertices and things like that. And so we sort of abandoned that. We kept the big chunky buttons and um, continued on making it run on desktop machines. So at the moment, we don't have an app. We have a, a VR version of this as well, which um, we developed for the HTC Vive. Um, so that you can put on a headset and replicate basically all of these actions while wandering around with 3D models in, 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 in a vibe that was specifically developed for a vibe. So in return to the VR model, would you have a, a VR sort of headset that could only take a mobile phone? Okay. Um, so yeah, you, um, um, you can visualize 3D models using that. If you, if you go to, um, all our models are lodged within a repository called Sketchfab, which is probably the most common place where 3D models are lodged publicly. And I'm pretty sure that if you use, you know, these little cardboard type things, that you can get Sketchfab to play those models, but we, we can't replicate the sort of measurements that sort of thing like we have here. However, we've built a version of the software that runs specifically for HTC Vive in which you can put the HTC Vive on and you can do all of those operations while in fully immersed in VR. But um, that was done as a student project and we haven't looked to try and take it to things like Oculus Quest and other things which are a, a, a lot easier to utilise because you don't need base station. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a question. So you've got a limited number of places that you can deploy it. Is it not the whole world? Are you just interested in getting more um, in terms of the OSIO database, the geology database, we, that would be fine, except for our main problem. We've got about, currently there's about 3,500 locations in Australia on OSIO. Yep. We have no funding. I've got another 2,000 that are sitting on my hard drive, but I don't have anyone to put in the metadata and things like that. The oh, big okay. hold up is the metadata more than, yeah. more than the models. Getting the models up is fine, but getting someone to sit down and encode all the metadata for every individual outcrop, every individual hand specimen that we've created yeah. is actually a slow process and it's one that I have to find funds for, which I currently don't have. So yeah. Yeah, there's, a couple of thousand, there's a couple of thousand yeah. extra models sitting there yeah. on my hard drives waiting to go and I can get someone to spend the, the large amount of time coding all that metadata. Yeah, so Oh, you, certainly, if you, want, if you had your own mountain and you, you'd say, um, we use um, Agisoft's um, Metashape software to do our 3, uh, 3D images. If you use the Metashape, you can take a model from, any model from Metashape directly into this 3D. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. you can make your own and just do it. Okay. Met, it's designed to accept the Metashape one properly. We've experimented, we built the OBJ importer as well, and we've experimented with an OBJ from Putnam, which other photogrammetry software it was. And we got it in there, but it's no guarantee if you have some other photogrammetry software that your OBJ will necessarily read into our software. Yeah, okay, but you need to have some research on there. You have to, you have to start with topography, yeah. and then you have to build a three-dimensional model utilising the processes of structure from motion and photogrammetry. Once you've got that three-dimensional model, you can plug into our software for analysis and measurement. Just to explain that this could be a PhD project. Yeah. What? Andrew Medida, are they? I'm just kidding. Can you join me now in thanking... There was one more. Sorry, sorry, go. Yes. Yeah, well, Colin, I've given Colin the software, but people in the industry are using it. Um, the people in the industry are using it for sky control, for instance. So they're using it for looking at mine, mine beaches and trying to work out what are the orientation of structural features on mine beaches that could cause failure in open mines, that sort of stuff. Um, GHD, local, well, not local, but international engineering consultancy, they use the software as well. So it's free, we just give it away. Thank you very much. Thank you.